Welcome to Indisputable. I am Sharon Reed in for the great Dr. Rashad Ritchie. And joining me as special guest host today is another great, one of my all time favorites, the all time favorite, <laughs> former Senator Nina Turner. Okay, you're always a senator to me because Thank that's what you. you carry. You carry it so well, your style, your grace, everything you have to say. And you're doing so much, Professor, Senior Fellow, Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy. They're lucky to have you. We are somebody.org, Senator. We want to hear more about that. Uh, but I think because we're honored to have your positions, your commentary today, we'll jump right into it if that's okay with you. Let's do it, Sharon. I am graced to be with you always. You are fire, baby. And you are <laughs> infinity. Okay, fire <laughs> infinity. Fire we'll get infinity. into that. We'll get into that. I'm sure our. Uh, Great TYT members are watching today and can't wait either. They'll comment. We'll get to those comments. Uh, we'll begin with this Trump immigrants poisoning the blood of our country. That's the latest. During a rally in New Hampshire, Donald Trump made some more incendiary comments towards immigrants. Watch, listen. Country, when they do that, we got a lot of work to do. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world. They're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Nobody's even looking at them. They just come in. Uh, the crime is going to be tremendous. The terrorism is going to be, terrorism is going to be. And we built a tremendous piece of the wall. And and so there you heard it, but he wasn't done. Okay, let's drive home the point. That's what you do when you're Donald Trump under multiple indictments. Trump then repeated the use of, quote, poisoning in a post on his social media website, Truth Social, saying overnight in all caps posts that illegal immigration is poisoning the blood of our nation. They're coming from prisons, from mental institutions, from all over the world. Sounds familiar. Now, it should sound familiar, not just because that then prospective candidate was coming down an escalator uttering that kind of rhetoric, but because the term blood poisoning was used by, that's right, Hitler, the mustache. In his manifesto, Ming Kemp, I'm sure the senator will correct me on the pronunciation. I didn't bother to learn it because, well, we know what Hitler stands for. But it is true that you do need to know your history and we should all be learning more about it. In which he criticized immigration and the mixing of races. All great cultures of the past perished only because the originally creative race died out from blood poisoning, Hitler wrote. Biden campaign released a statement criticizing Trump's remarks. Donald Trump channeled his role models as he parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, <coughs> quoted Vladimir Putin. While running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. Trump is not shying away from his plan to lock up millions of people into detention camps and continues to lie about that time when Joe Biden obliterated him by over 7 million votes three years ago. That from the Biden campaign, NBC News delivering it. There's also been responses from other GOP members. Here's what Senator Lindsey Graham had to say. When asked about it, any time just in on history. the language, just on the language, though, I want to get your response. You have endorsed former President Trump. Are yeah. you comfortable with him using words like that? You know, we're talking about language. I could care less what language people use as long as we get it right. Even I believe in legal immigration. I have no animosity toward people trying to come to our country. I have animosity against terrorists and against drug dealers. Do you think he would appeal to more people, though, if he chose different words on that argument? You know, I think the president has a way of talking sometimes I disagree with, but he actually delivered on the border. People are looking for results. If the only thing you want to talk about on immigration is the way Donald Trump talks, you're missing a lot. Just finally, is it the position of the Republican Party that African and Asian immigrants are poisoning the blood of the people in this country? No, it's the position of the Republican Party that we've lost control of the border, that terrorists are coming, that there's never been a higher threat to the United States from a terrorist attack from a broken border. Well, 
a dictatorship is a threat. And by the way, we were talking about Hitler, weren't we? Let's hear what the Republican for president, Chris Christie, had to say about this. He commented too. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. And look, Jake, the other problem with this is the Republicans who are saying this is okay. Um, almost 100 members of Congress who have endorsed him. Nikki Haley, who this week said he is fit to be president. You're telling me that someone who says that uh, immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country, someone who, who, who says Vladimir Putin is a character witness, is fit to be president of the United States, was the right president at the right time, Nikki Haley should be ashamed of herself. And she's part of the problem because she's enabling him. She's enabling him by saying to people, it's okay. Let me be really clear. I'm in this race to let people know it's not okay. It's not okay for an American president to be saying these things. And yet Chris Christie is not resonating, not resonating with Republican voters. Senator, we can't even get to the part where we chase Chris Christie's record. You know, the part where he was aligned with Donald Trump, who did come down that escalator, was saying racist things, never stopped saying racist things. Because right there, the bar is so low, Chris Christie knew to say, this is disgusting. You are stealing from Hitler, you're plagiarizing. Hitler, and that's disgusting. He's right, though, about these other candidates. But what about the electorate who could care less about, apparently, Hitler? Yeah, Sharon. I mean, most of what Chris Christie said, I agree with, but you're right. We can't even get to unpacking his baggage because the bar is very low. So I want to take people back just a little bit. I'm not so sure about that. I necessarily agree with the comparison that the White House did of Hitler only because, and only because of this. Trump is ridiculous in every sense of the word. All this nonsense he's talking that people coming from Asia and Africa. Notice it's Asia and Africa. He didn't say anything about European immigrants to this country. So let me just school some folks. Everybody in this damn country traces their ancestors for the most part, like 99%. You're going to trace your ancestors to some other country with the exception of indigenous people. All right, and I'm gonna put an asterisk in there for American descendants of enslaved people. All right, the asterisk there is that those descendants didn't ask to come here, didn't come here voluntarily, they were forced to come here. So the indigenous people and the people whose ancestors were forced to come here to be chattel slaves, those are the exceptions. Everybody else, your ancestors came here. You ain't original. Donald Trump got some damn nerves. His damn wife is an immigrant for God's sakes. But you know why he didn't? Because he didn't name anybody from Europe. Sharon, the reason why we have to be careful with comparing him to Hitler. Okay. Hitler exercised pure unadulterated genocide. Okay, so we got to be careful with that. Another reason why we got to be careful is because in this country, through policies, this country discriminated against every other kind of immigrant, with the exception of European immigrants from the West and Northern parts of Europe. Hello, somebody. I'm going to unpack this for them, Sharon, because I want them to go back and look this stuff up. So early immigration laws in this country. So what Donald Trump is parroting more than Hitler, because see, they trying to be spicy with that. I, I don't play games with it. Just call the man out, but don't play games with the Hitler stuff. We should be very careful with that. What he is parroting is the policies of this damn country, which, which people want to pretend like it didn't happen. So I'm going to unpack this for folks. 1790, the Natural Naturalization Act of 1790 excluded non-white people from eligibility to be naturalized citizens in this country. In order to become a naturalized citizen in this country in 1790, you had to have two years worth of residency in the United States. You had to be of good moral moral character. Who the hell judges that? This whole country was not a good moral character because of the enslavement of African American uh, Africans and then their descendants. But I'll put that in the parking lot. Then the last one, Sharon, you must be a free white person. So wow. what Trump is parroting 
is the policies of this damn country. And it makes people uncomfortable to tell that kind of truth. Let me keep on going. The Naturalization Act of 1795, you had to have five-year residency. The Naturalization Act of 1798 said the hell with it. You got to be a resident here for years. And then the Naturalization Act of 1802 took it back to five years. There was a series of restrictions. If we look at 1875, no criminals. Okay, I can understand that. If you know people coming over here and they criminals, okay, we, we let, let's talk about that. People with contagious diseases, people who were going to uh, import prostitutes weren't allowed right. to come into this country. And then, then the 1875 one, which is all about messing with our Asian sisters and brothers and family and friends. Now, in the 1900s, though, this country shifted from um, putting a premium on European immigrants that came from the northern and western part of Europe. And they started saying, OK, the southern and eastern Europeans can come up into this piece. And then they reverted back. So let me be clear for folks. I know people don't like Donald J. Trump. And for those who don't like him based on his policy positions and based on the crazy foolishness stuff that he is spouting out of his mouth, I get it. But to compare that man to Hitler is a path too far. What we should be comparing him to is a time in this country where through policy, it discriminated against non-white immigrants. And it only really wanted immigrants from the northern and western part of Europe. Let's go and tell the truth about the United States of America. Trump is more, he is, he is unfortunately sharing a personification of the bad old days in the United States of America. Wow, I gave you the multiple titles at the top of the show. <laughs> Professor Turner, is it too late for this journalist to audit your class? Because what you have just done is broken through the facade, the lie, the history that would have made us feel a little bit better as Americans and you've said, yes. That's it was shame. bad, but instead of looking over there, what's that over there? Germany, Hitler's, Hitler's legacy. We have one here. Yes. It is dark. It is desperate, and it's about to repeat itself. That is a hell of a history lesson today. And so, how, when you have Americans, no disrespect, more attuned to USA Today and New York Post headlines? Instead of a deep dive into who we really are, how do you, how do you, even the one woman force that you are, how can we spread the word that, uh uh, it's about us? And that includes you living at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, President Biden. That includes you. Why won't anyone call this out as you just have? Sharing that part, it's about us over here. I'm so glad you said it. Before we go over there in other people's waters, let's just go on and do, deal with this right here. I mean, the first, what, 14 or so presidents, you know, the first uh, few presidents owned slaves, enslaved people. So no, we ain't got to go all the way over there to Hitler. I think part of it, Sharon, is doing what we are doing here today. I know the Biden administration wants to win the race. You should do everything to win, but not anything to win. Everything to win, but not anything to win. And it's serious business, even to compare somebody that is as backwards as Donald J. Trump to Hitler. Just go ahead and tell the truth about it. That in today's America, that's the way we could, that, that we would expect that anybody running for president or any office in this country wouldn't still hold the views that this country had in the 1700s. That's what we would hope, that we would have a president that wouldn't take us backwards. And your other point, Sharon, about we looking at you over there, uh, President Biden, don't forget it wasn't that long mm -hmm. ago before he told Charlemagne the God on his yeah. show that if you, if, if, if you don't know whether you voting for me or Donald J. Trump, you ain't black. That, that happened in 21st century. And Joseph R. Biden said that. This is the same yeah. president who said that he didn't want his kids going to school with black kids because he didn't want his kids to go to school in a jungle. OK, so let's unpack all of this stuff. Let's be against anybody that takes positions or have policies that take our country backwards. We should be moving forward. And the fact that Trump, he knew exactly what he was doing. But I wish it was only Trump. It's not only Trump. Now, they saying that uh, Biden beat him by seven million votes. Well, in fact, yeah, he did. However, 
Trump got over 70 million votes. So that means that we're dealing with a bigger conundrum. We have a bigger conundrum than Donald J. Trump. It's called America and the psyche of far too many Americans when it comes to race and race relations. Mm-hmm. And, and, and some white people thinking that this was they, their land. It wasn't their land. Wow. They stole this land from the indigenous people and then brought our black behinds over here to, to, to work it. Now, that's the truth. That's the Cliff Notes version wow. of the truth. Huh. This historical cleansing that makes some people feel so good is dangerous. Because while Hitler is that historical terrorist figure. That's right. Once you realize that it was right here on this soil, it didn't belong to us, by the way. Didn't belong to you. It was right here. And that history can repeat itself right here. That's a whole nother animal. And the way you broke down the recent historical comments of the current president who was on that super predator tip too, wasn't he? The crime um, bill, Anita Hill. I mean, we could go on uh, and on. We have our work cut out for us, and it starts with auditing your class, Professor, Senator Nina Turner. I'm serious. You schooled Anytime, me, you schooled Sharon. us all, and um, you do it with such grace, such fire. I'll take the Cliff Notes version. If Americans can just get that, we have a leg up, okay, if we could just get that. Clarence Thomas hinted he would quit, he'd resign if he didn't get more money. He wanted a pay raise or he would walk. Now what dummy gave the raise after that? My own commentary. Early January 2000, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was at a five star beach resort in Sea Island, Georgia. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Fancy vacation for someone so deep in debt. Thomas had grown frustrated with his financial situation, according to friends. He had recently started raising his young grandnephew, and Thomas's wife was soliciting advice on how to handle the new expenses. At the resort, Thomas gave a speech. At an off the record conservative conference, found himself seated next to a Republican member of Congress on the flight home. Interesting. The two men talked, and the lawmaker left the conversation worried that Thomas might resign. Congress should give Supreme Court justices a pay raise, Thomas told him. If lawmakers didn't act, one or more justices will leave soon, maybe in the next year. At the time, Thomas's salary was $173,600, equivalent to over $300,000 today. But he was one of the least wealthy members of the court. And on multiple occasions in that period, he pushed for ways to make more money. In other private conversation, Thomas repeatedly talks about removing a ban on justices giving paid speeches. Pro publica with the factoids here. Thomas's efforts, including a confidential memo to Chief Justice William Rehnquist from a top judiciary official seeking guidance on what he termed a delicate matter. It's not clear if the Chief Justice at the time ever responded. Several months later, Rehnquist focused his annual year end report on what he called the most pressing issues facing the judiciary, the need to increase judicial salaries, most pressing issues facing the judiciary. Hmm. Several people close to Thomas told ProPublica they believed that it was implausible the justice would ever retire early and that he may have exaggerated his concerns to bolster the case for a raise, you think? But around 2000, chatter that Thomas was dissatisfied about money circulated through conservative legal circles and on Capitol Hill. According to interviews with prominent attorneys, former members of Congress and Thomas's friends, It was clear he was unhappy with his financial situation and his salary, one friend said. Former Senator Trent Lott, then the Republican Senate Majority Leader, recalled in a recent interview that there were serious concerns at the time that Clarence Thomas or other justices would leave. Long, long way from his Republican Party. Around that time, Thomas was also pushing to allow justices to make paid speeches, a source of income that had been banned in the 1980s. On several occasions, Thomas discussed lifting the ban with appellate judge David Hansen, who chaired the Judiciary's Committee 
responsible for lobbying Congress on issues like pay, according to Meacham's memo. At Senator Mitch McConnell's request, a provision removing the ban for judges was quietly inserted into a spending bill in mid-2000. Why McConnell made the proposal became a subject of scrutiny in the legal press. After the Legal Times reported the measure had been dubbed the Keep Scalia on the Court Bill, Scalia responded that the honorarium ban makes no difference to me and denied that he would ever leave the court for financial reasons. Ban was never lifted. McConnell did not respond to requests for comment. Congress never lifted the ban on speaking fees or gave the justices a major raise. But in the years that followed, a ProPublica report said Thomas accepted a stream of gifts from friends, acquaintances that appears to be unparalleled in the modern history of the Supreme Court. Some defrayed living expenses, large and small, private school tuition, vehicle batteries, tires, other gifts from a well, ultra rich men supplemented his lifestyle, such as free international vacations on the private jet and super yacht of Dallas real estate billionaire. You've heard the name before, Harlan Crow. It's all coming together, Senator. Uh, this is the same Clarence Thomas who believes that everyone can make it in America if you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Perhaps he recognized being. One of the only, perhaps then the only, on the high court. What's different about me? I didn't come from wealth. I, well, I wonder what's different about me. Hmm. Maybe he asked his wife. I don't know. But this is a damning report. Where would Clarence Thomas go if he left the Supreme Court? Hadn't heard of him prior. Have you heard of him? You remember if you heard of him prior? To when not. the senior Bush gave us the gift that keeps giving Clarence Thomas. This is historical horrificness. And it's how we got here today. It is, Sharon. It was against, I mind you, a Supreme Court uh, justice did not want, you know, did not want him to, to take his place. Thurgood Marshall did not want Clarence Thomas okay. to take his place because he knew what kind of man he was. Yeah, I'm gonna take a little different take on this. I, I think this is one of the rare moments that we see Clarence Thomas being like everybody else. And that's that's a point that you had brought up, like everybody else, that he was reminded of who he was and what he really came from, which is working class people. The fact that Supreme Court justice, look, I'm not I'm not against the Supreme Court justices getting a raise. I do understand why there would be a ban on speaking engagement because it's much more easier to manipulate that in ways that would probably harm the integrity of the court as if the integrity of that court is not harmed already. But hopefully our viewers know where I'm going with this. But Clarence Thomas did not come from a lot of wealth. And as much as he tries to make people forget, he's a black man in America. And oftentimes as black people in America, no matter what your status or stature is, you will be reminded of that. And then lastly, the man wouldn't go. Nobody, people just don't give up lifetime, lifetime appointments, Sharon. I don't care how, much, how little it pays. You, you're not, bro, you're not giving up a lifetime appointment. That's why he didn't go anywhere. But his argument, you know, despite the fact that I do not agree with Justice Thomas, that that Justice Thurgood Marshall was absolutely right. He was not the right person to replace somebody of Thurgood Marshall, Justice Thurgood Marshall's uh, integrity and what he stood for in terms of the uplift of black people and 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 civil rights. T Thomas is the exact opposite. However, as grandma said, used to say, a broke clock can be right, right twice a day. Mm. The fact that he talked about, hey, maybe we need a raise, I don't see anything wrong, wrong with that at all. And I'm glad it makes him, it humanizes him in a way, Sharon, that I had yeah. seen or read in a, in a long time. Yeah, my grandmother used to also say even a blind squirrel can find a nut once in a while, right? Once in a while. So yes. I think you're right. Do we want Supreme Court justices who are deciding our very lives and the future of our country, in many cases, setting this legal precedent, scrounging and scraping to pay off loans, right. to live uh, as uh, even comparable to their peers. Is that what we want yes. or do we want them being more Thurgood Marshall-like and not being able to be bought and paid right. for, okay? Do you have any doubt though that Clarence Thomas was the one circulating these 
rumors and then perhaps try to pin it on Scalia, okay? <laughs> hey, that, that, that was Clarence Thomas, or maybe Jenny. <laughs> maybe Jenny was texting again. That was think? smooth though. That, that, was, that was real smooth because it that, was believable. that was believable, <laughs> yeah. wasn't it? What yeah. should happen now? Because ProPublica has done, Senator, incredible reporting. They have, and they've uncovered a lot of things. And all I hear from fellow Americans, pundits, commentators, I don't really care. But it's everything, isn't it? Look where the court has taken us in just the last two years. I, I know. And again, depending on who appoints these justices, that's the type of uh, personalities we get. So this court is uh, very much to the right. No doubt about it, because Trump had the opportunity to appoint several of them. But, you know, another message in this story, Sharon, is the class, the, the class divide, you know, in this country. And as much as I would never have thought that Justice Thomas would give us a searing example of the class divide in this country, he really is in, in him really lobbying to get a pay raise that he is not, he was not at that time among the ultra wealthy in this country. And we see that that is skewed, that the more wealth that you have, the more opportunity to run for certain offices. Of course, you don't run to become Supreme Court justice. He was appointed. But again, another point about the class consciousness mm -hmm. in, in every sphere of elected office. It's quite, this is quite, I'm stunned. Yeah, Jane, I really am. Yeah, I think you're right to illustrate that point. Um, I, I'll make one final point that it's interesting to me that as Clarence Thomas fled his case privately to the right ears about, hey, we don't make enough for, for all of this. I can't survive on all of this, that these same Republican lawmakers scrambled and tried to get something done to give Clarence Thomas hope. These are the same lawmakers who historically have said $10 an hour, $15 an hour, $20 an hour to give everyday Americans some hope who were at the end of their rope, who were ready to quit on the line. They, they were done. They had nowhere else to go, okay? It wasn't about keeping up with the Joneses. It was about keeping food on the table. And oh yeah, do I even have a table or a roof over my head? That part. I'll give you the last word, then we'll take a quick break. No, you you better preach. <laughs> if mm. the audience can see me, I'm like an amen. You better preach. That part. Sharon. Yeah. It's interesting. We'll follow up with it. I've heard you on the first two stories. This is why we love her. Okay. Give excellent commentary, a history lesson, Back and even uh, right. Give us some reference points for two people you may not agree with, but may in this instance. Relate to your circumstance. Senator Nina Turner, we appreciate you. I'm Sharon Reed. And for Dr. Rashad Ritchie today, we're right back. Welcome back to Indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed. And for Dr. Rashad Ritchie today, our special guest host is the one and only Senator Nina Turner. And boy, um, you've had that professor hat on today. I love it. I love learning from you, being inspired from you, getting fired up. You make me, well, it's a call to action, Senator. That's who you are. I do want to give uh, the viewers an opportunity to respond because they're already weighing in about our first story. Immigrants poisoning the blood of our country, says one Donald Trump. Next TYT reporter. This means my struggle, me and Kemp. Did I say it right, Senator? Main Kemp. Main Kemp. Main Kemp. Kemp. Mm -hmm. It means my struggle. Hitler saw himself as a victim, much like Donald Trump does. I can't argue with that. Next CYT reporter, I think you're right, okay? Mm -hmm. K Flock says, wait, if immigrants are destroying countries all over the world, then where do the immigrants come from? Is he getting the meaning of the word alien confused? Hmm. You too, also on the immigrant poisoning the blood of our country, the Perfect statements by Donald J. Trump. Our JL Network says Adolf would be pleased with Donald. But again, our own Senator Turner making the point that you can talk about Hitler if you want to, okay, if that's what gets you going. But there's something that happened here on American soil, okay, decade after decade after decade after decade. After, I could go on and on. You're getting into centuries here. We that's did right. it here, is what that's the right. Senator said. And so when the White House responds, 
and loves that buzzword because you know that's what Hitler is, the buzzword with meaning behind, right? We know what it means when you talk about Hitler, but the more genuine reference would be what happened here. What we did in this country right here. And that may help you relate a little better to what Donald Trump is doing and how close the threat really is. It's just you just pull it out of your bag of tricks from 100, 200 years ago, okay? Oh, by the way, still feeling fallout, aren't we? We're still engaged in a lot of this. Uh, Bernie the Kiwi Dragon says, I appreciate Nina's striving for accuracy and precision. You see, people do like to learn. When you present it in that format, Senator, people will receive it. And then they're gonna go run and tell it too, okay? I hope Got some so, holiday Sharon. meals coming up yeah. and it will be discussed. And they will quote you, I wish you Karen would. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a in Sunday? A you're you're still friends, back off! I'm gonna tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Well, then maybe you should tell him to stay. How many? Because that's all I what are you gonna do? Are you out of your mind? The conversation has nothing to do with you. I'm talking about you, you little. That's who I'm talking about. You disrespectful as a. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Don't teach your son how to have respect for adults. Just ignore. Would you like a trophy for him too? Just for showing up? I hope to God you're talking to him right now. Because today is the day my kid died. So unless you and him want to die, I'd shut the up. You ain't considering those white trash, net face having. Karen lashing out at a child. Did you hear the cries? Lashing out at a child who did nothing more than stand up for his mother. Senator, I'm gonna let you unpack this one. One thing I noticed over and over as besides the mouth, the constant and the just deranged way of speaking to a child and acting a fool in this convenience store was that she kept on her tippy toes as if she needed to stand bigger and louder and just overpowering. Again, a child, who is this kind of person and where does this deep, dark, disgusting anger originate from. Great observation, Sharon, on the tippy toes. I didn't notice that at first, but now that you said it, this woman needs help. I mean, you talk about a mental health breakdown right then and there. I think, did I hear her say this is the day that her child died, her kid died? I, I thought she said something like that. And if you guys don't want to die. So it's clearly that that's if, in fact, I'm right that she said that that still does not excuse. OK, that does not excuse her behavior, but it's very clear that she was triggered. She was having a mental health a breakdown. However, you don't talk to nobody's child like that. So either she going to get some mental help or she gonna get a butt kicked that she could not have talked to my child like that. Yeah. You know, my grandmother had many, many sayings, as the viewers of TYT know. My grandmother used to say, you mess with mine, I'm going to jail and you going to hell. Because see, this is how this is going to roll. <laughs> uh, you do not talk to somebody's baby the way yeah. that she did. She was out of line. And if she was having a hard day, obviously, you know, if in fact, it's, you know, she, she lost her child. That is a painful burden for any parent to bear because it's really out of the natural order of things as we see yes. life. That that if Mother Nature takes a, a a course that we're accustomed to, then it would be the child bearing bearing or, or bearing the, the the parent or putting the parent to rest. Excuse mm -hmm. me, my tongue tied on that word. But mm -hmm. um, really sad to see this woman act out yeah. in that way. Yeah, it is. And you raise a few points here, and I tend to agree with you. I can't imagine. I don't want to, and I feel for people who have lost their precious gift. Right, their child, it's untenable. But when I imagine that gosh, so many others have, 
sadly. This is a privilege to be able to spew and act out in this way and not, not be tased or taken, taken to the ground or worse. When you talk about mental health, I agree with you. But this is a, perhaps what we're seeing was a mental health episode. I recently had a conversation, might have been yesterday, with a black Republican friend of mine. And he said he does not consider whether the people he deals with, white, People are racist, and he just does us no good to even speculate or entertain it. It's an affliction, and it's all about the transaction. How can you help me? And so what he's suggesting is great empathy for people like this. I couldn't wait to bring that up with you because I need you to, I don't know, pontificate. Well, Sharon, you can pontificate with the best of us. We're very good at that together. I understand what your Republican friend is saying, but you cannot erase, you can't just ignore systemic. See, people get confused about what prejudice is. You know, you discrimination from an individual, prejudice from an individual may not have, does not have this type of systemic impact that when you have it on whole, of a country in its policies, what we see socially, politically, economically, environmentally, that is what we mean by systemic racism. So in that, I disagree with your Republican friend. Now, if he's trying to say, you know, take people as they come, have some empathy for individuals, then okay, I I, I may can agree with that, but we just cannot turn, we can't, we can't just say, oh, don't worry about it. No, we have to worry about systemic racism and the impact that it has, and especially anti-black racism, because it still is permeating to this day. There's a reason why Trump named, going back to that story, Africa first, which is a continent, uh, Donald J. Trump, just in case. And, you know, I'm sorry, Chairman, you <laughs> talked about the damn wall. Uh, uh, Africans uh, from the 50 or so, 52 or so countries uh, on the continent, they not jumping the wall, bro. No. So no. that wall, you know, he was no. just complaining all kinds. Of, I'm sorry on this segment just to go back to him, but it just made me think. Yeah, that well, it doesn't have to be accurate. Matt, yeah, right? you, you <laughs> right because he's just saying in Africa and Asia they not jumping walls, bro. So it's 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 you you cannot ignore systems that barrel down on people generation after generation. Mm-hmm. Now that does not mean that we can't have some sympathy and or empathy for certain people who at times we may or may not agree with from a policy yeah. perspective. So if that is where he's coming from, I, I get that. And I can say, okay, I, I might be able to do that from time to time, but we cannot ignore systemic racism and yeah. oppression, just cannot. Not when the policies are built on this this way of thinking and this affliction, right? If you're acting right. upon it, it's one thing if you wanna be in your home and this is what you believe, but once you, that Don't part. allow me to achieve. You're blocking me. Like, what are these? The best are line block backers, the blockers, Senator Turner. I, I think are they, so. What do they do? I, That's I, the O line, right? The line, I used the line to know backers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I used to know football. Once <laughs> you're doing that and preventing me from just trying to score a win in this life, come on. We have to deal with it, don't we? We have to deal we with it. We have to deal with it. So well, sad for you. that. By Karen, the way, he was the Karen. one. Me too. Me too. But he would. My Republican friend was the one pontificating. I, I like the way you kind of just shaped it and made us think, okay? Mm-hmm. He brought it right back home. Called Film Me to Sex Tape inside the Senate building. Senate staffer, sex tape in the building. Hmm. Per media, Democratic staffer Aiden Mays Zerovsky terminated over the weekend after being identified online as allegedly one of the two participants in a very graphic pornographic video filmed in a Senate hearing room. That video was then shared in the chat of a private group for gay men in politics. According to conservative news site Daily Caller, which broke the story but did not identify the staffer and blurred the faces of the two men in the video when posting. Daily Caller, a conservative site, first published a blurred out version of the video and a story Daily Caller identified the room in the video as Senate Room Heart 216, the Judiciary Room. The room holds many important meetings, according to the US Senate website, heavy with the details there. An NBC News headline Saturday about the staffer being no longer employed by Maryland Democratic Senator Ben Cardin, 
after the porn scandal framed the story around the conservative outlets that first reported the news of the leaked video drawing outrage. Political reported Saturday, other conservative outlets identified the person responsible as Maïs Thorovsky, a legislative aide to the senator. On his LinkedIn page, Maïs Thorovsky claimed to be the victim of prejudice, saying he was being attacked for who I love to pursue a political agenda. This has been a difficult time for me as I've been attacked for who I love to pursue a political agenda. While some of my actions in the past have shown poor judgment, I love my job. I would never disrespect my workplace. Hmm. Any attempts to characterize my actions otherwise are fabricated. I'll be exploring what legal options are available to me in these matters. NBC News covered the story on Saturday afternoon with this article under the headline, Senate staffer alleged by conservative outlets to have had sex in a hearing room is no longer employed. There you see the headline. The subhead reads, conservative news outlets alleged that the aide to Senator Ben Cardin, Democrat out of Maryland, appeared in a leaked video showing men having sex in a Senate hearing room. When NBC's conservatives pounce, headline hit X, formerly Twitter. The framing of the story was immediately noted and ridiculed by the right. Republican Congressman Mike Collins even took to trolling Senator Amy Klobuchar, who had led a committee hearing in the room just last week and whose desk appeared to have served as the backdrop of the couple's sexual act in the video. And you see what the trolling was about. Lots of those products that we could not get at the height of COVID. That's the picture that was beamed down. Um, this one is, I think there's several headlines here, Senator Turner. Just the truth, ju- just the truth. Uh, maybe all things can be true that were alleged, political agenda, this, that, but also you, you did this. Um, it did show poor judgment. Where do you make this make sense, the reporting of it? And you laid it. I mean, all of those things are true at the same time. There is a political agenda, always a political agenda. You know, people are starving in this country. People need higher wages. And these folks end up here playing tabloid uh, tootsies. And I just mm-hmm. made that up. That don't even exist. But, you know, they just playing games, they playing in our face. Now, this Senate staffer does not have a leg to stand on, however, uh, you know, talking, uh, you know, I'm being this about who I love and who I am. No, nah, bruh. It's because you had sex and somebody filmed it in the judiciary hearing room. It could have been in a broom closet and it would have still been the same thing. It's called impulse control. And the question then, though, becomes, though, sharing from a political perspective, would the Republicans be saying the same things if it was a Republican staffer and if it was heterosexual sex? So let's take heterosexual gays. Let's put all that in the parking lot. The fact of the matter is, is that staffers, senators, Congress, baby, you got to have a little more impulse control than mm-hmm. to have sex in, in, in the judiciary hearing room. Or like I said, I don't care if it was a broom closet. So no, they not just coming after you because of who you love and who you are. They coming after you because you had sex uh, in the judiciary hearing room and somebody, some genius decided they were going to film it. You know, that's yeah. part of it. Yeah, that's I the think major right. part of it, Sharon. That, that's the major part of it. I don't know yeah. what you thought you were doing there. And quite frankly, if I am Senator Klobuchar, I am going to check my area because I, don't, I just don't want that there, Senator, where I'm trying to decide these important matters. But also in that room, if you can recall recent history, I mean, Jim Jordan was in that room before, other people in that room before, which used for multiple purposes, people who just may, perhaps didn't. Do this deed, but they did some pretty dirty things in that room. Okay, that we were all privy to and had to witness. So no doubt, the, the, this is an outrageous thing. Okay, I'm not suggesting that you should have sex in your workplace and film it, but I am suggesting that it, no one's hands are clean here in some of this reporting. Just the truth. That's just, true. Just the truth sometimes. Um, but and we all have failings too, Sharon. So let me just right. put that out there. Some people's yeah. failings might not play out exactly like that. 
Yeah. But every human being has a failing. Yeah. And who were you at that age is what I like to say to some people who want to be, you know, yeah. sitting at top. Judgmental. Right. Yeah. Sitting at top your perch. Who were mm-hmm. you? And so you might want to consider that. But we'll see how it plays out. Maybe somebody will sue. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, this is indisputable. The great Senator Nina Turner joins us as special guest host today. I'm Sharon Reed in for Dr. Rashad Ritchie. We're right back. We do have some breaking news to get to. Jonathan Majors found guilty of assault. A New York jury found actor Jonathan Majors guilty of assault in the third degree and guilty of harassment. That verdict reached by a six person jury after roughly over four hours of deliberation spread across three days. Jonathan Majors wearing a gray suit and black dress shirt and tie sat with his attorneys, with family members. And his loyal girlfriend, Megan Good, behind him as the verdict was read, he was found not guilty of one of the counts in assault in the third degree and not guilty of aggravated harassment in the second degree. But again, the mixed verdict, Jonathan Majors found guilty of assault. He did face four charges of assault, aggravated harassment and harassment after he called 911 March 25th when he said he found his ex-partner Grace Jabari unconscious in their apartment. Police arrested Majors after finding apparent injuries on Jabari, including a laceration behind her ear and a bruised and fractured finger. Majors pleaded not guilty to all charges, the Hollywood Reporter breaking the news. The arrest has already had implications on what had been the biggest year of Majors' career, which included starring roles in Ant-Man and The Wasp, Quantumania, Creed 3, and Loki Season 2. In the wake of his arrest, Both his publicity firm, the lead company, and managers of Management 360 dropped him. And the Disney-owned Searchlight Features removed magazine dreams from its release calendar. So Majors, Senator, uh, again, a mixed verdict, found guilty uh, of uh, assault in the third degree harassment, not guilty of two other charges. He could spend up to a year in prison. Um, What do you make of this? Some said he should have tried to settle this. I listen, we know who who the lawyer is that he uh, retained. I would suspect they tried to make this go away. But I'm more curious about all the people who seem to have this poor analogy, but a dog in this fight, people who weren't there, leaks, different things as he tried to fight for his career. That's really why he said, now I got I got to try to beat these charges here. I still don't know what happened, but we all seem to have an opinion here. And it seems to be based on personal experience, um, perhaps our own view of the world through race and identity and how we see things. A black man at the top of his game, Donald Majors could do no wrong and was just soaring and gifted. I think we have to acknowledge gifted. And suddenly you have this stereotypical uh, two people, right? Black man and a white woman involved in an altercation. And the prosecutor using words like psychological abuse, a history of psychological abuse that Jonathan Majors had exhibited on the injured party as the, the government saw this case, the jurisdiction saw this case. That struck me. Again, I don't know what happened. And he's been found guilty two of the four counts. But that struck me because when I consider a black man in psychological abuse in America, I'm just telling you it stuck with me. I'm not making excuses, Senator. And I know I'm not being very artful here. Perhaps you can clean it up. Do you understand where I'm going with it? It's just a bystander. I do. I mean, you're doing a fine job. I mean, your journalistic integrity is showing. You First of all, you read the four counts and you made it very clear that two two yeah. of them he they they didn't hold him accountable for two of them and two of them he was and now we got to wait for sentencing yeah it is a complicated issue uh, we all sin and fall short of the glory of god some of us sin harder than others that's a fact we were not there we don't know all the contours to this is it reasonable to assume that biases seeped in absolutely because it's called being human that does not mean that Major did not do any of the things that he just got 
you know, uh, uh, tried for and the jury came back on two counts. They said, oh, yeah, you did those things. And on two counts, we don't believe that you did those things. And your point about him having to fight for his career and deciding, hey, I'm going to fight this thing out. Well, he did. And sometimes, you know, my son sent me this interesting quote this morning that said something like, in life, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And hopefully this is a learning experience for Major. And if he does need to get some anger management or whatever he needs to do to restore himself, I hope that he gets that. His career is not over. We need some time to pass. I think he's going to be just fine because you're right. He is gifted. Uh, he is gifted in this world. And it's, I think ultimately is is going to be all right uh, for him. Yeah. And I hate what about is them until I don't mind it. <laughs> there are, well, right. okay. I'm just being honest that's, with you. Perhaps true. I'm the hypocrite, you know, because yeah. well, at well, the sure, end of the life, day, life makes a hypocrite of us you. all. I just Thank wanted to you, say Senator. that. You see, all I of just us. want to be honest. No, I all just of want us. want to be honest. And when we talk about canceling him for this event, we all have our view of the justice system too, right? And that's based on where we sit in this society. Yeah. I think of names like Depp and Sheen mm. and others, even, well, there's others, okay? Yeah. And they were seen as Hollywood bad boys and they never got canceled. Right. Okay. Even even the fact that people say, well, Depp had to get his name back. He wasn't ever really canceled. He wasn't no. destitute. He was still doing some things, okay? He still representation. That's and exactly this whole thing right. where in two seconds, I just read you the verdict, this mixed verdict. In two seconds, PR firm dropped him, major. <laughs> Management dropped him. And that's the double standard. Again, I'm not, and the senator's not making any excuses here. No. We don't know what happened, but that's the rub. I'll give you the last word. No, I mean, you're right. This is complicated. And maybe we can unpack this a little more at another time. This is breaking news. So we're just giving it to people as we just received yeah. it. It's a lot more. But when you talk about who society allows to have mercy, and who society does not allow oftentimes, and we got all the receipts to back this up, it's not black people. Yeah. And oftentimes, especially, it's not black men. I mean, you talk about making a rebound. I mean, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, to be exact, you know, with Monica Lewinsky, you and I were talking about that a little bit in a different angle, you know, during the break. But the same thing, he ain't miss yep. a beat. No. You know, so who do we allow to have mercy? Who do we back up? Even yeah. when the evidence points clearly to them being wrong. So Sharon Reed, you're right. We're not justifying anything. We were not there. It's breaking news. But it is an immutable fact that yeah. black people, especially black men, don't get the same kind of mercy, especially when it comes to having relationships mm -hmm. with black, with excuse me, white women. Mm -hmm. A lot of black men have gotten killed. Yeah, they have. And been and lied I'm, on too. That part. I know one who would not have ascended to the presidency or been able to serve two terms had a fraction, That's a it. fraction of what's come out on some other presidents who may or may not have been pretty decent in their tenure. He would not have, are you kidding me? He would have been yeah. driven out of there and would have been some of the people who look like him provided with a narrative that allowed them to join in and say, yep, you're, here's your standard. You got to go. So that's all I'm pointing out here. Ramaswamy campaign with former infamous, with infamous former representative Steve King. You remember Steve King? Or have you forgotten? Oh, mind you. Des Moines, Iowa, Steve King, former Republican Iowa congressman with a history of racist and controversial statements. That's putting it mildly. Reemerged on the political scene this week, campaigning with Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy Wednesday. I've been told it's Vivek, and I've been saying Vivek. Perhaps someone will let me know, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Although King has not endorsed Ramaswamy officially, he did express his intention to caucus for the Ohio businessmen. And support has been welcomed by Ramaswamy with open arms. King riding on Ramaswamy's campaign bus, the pair have campaigned together often, speaking in opposition to the use of eminent domain to build carbon capture pipelines in Iowa, a stump issue for Ramaswamy as he continues his barnstorming of the state. CBS News with the reporting here. 
King, who served in Congress for 18 years, lost the GOP primary for his district in 2020 after defending the terms white nationalism. Now is it coming back for you? And white supremacy, nothing wrong with it in his view, in a 2019 interview with the New York Times. It drew widespread bipartisan condemnation, white nationalists, white supremacists, Western civilization. How did that language become offensive? King told the Times in the interview. Ramaswamy would go on to defend King during a presser. Okay, let's watch. I did get to know him. And I have to say that my impression of Steve is that he is he's a good man. That he's somebody who deeply cares about this country. That he's somebody who has been misunderstood and misportrayed. And so I'm not going to take the media's narrative. I'm going to form my own judgment of the people who we ally ourselves with. And so far, my judgment is actually very different than the media's judgment that this is a man who cares about this country. Well, I guess he's a thought leader for some and that should do it. Maybe not. Ramaswamy had previously talked about the great replacement theory during the GOP debate being real. An ideology that Steve King has pushed in the past when talking about white birth rates. Well, let's hear that. Uh, to the German people and to any population of people that is a declining population that doesn't, isn't willing to have enough babies to reproduce themselves. And I've said to them, you cannot rebuild your civilization with somebody else's babies. You've got to keep your birth rate up and that you need to teach your children your values. And in doing so, then you can grow your population and you can strengthen your culture. You can strengthen your way of life. That's a clear message that we need to get our birth rates up. I wish I hadn't eaten before sitting in the host chair today. It's about to come up. Hearing that, I have heard it before, but it's about to come up. Wish I hadn't eaten. In a prior interview, Ramaswamy would also defend offensive remarks made by Trump. Q. Abby Phillips. Over the weekend, I just want to play this from what President Trump said to his supporters. We will root out the communists, Marxist, fascist, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. The threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. That language, they live like vermin. Do you believe that that is, as your Republican colleague Chris Christie has said, neo-Nazi rhetoric? This is a classic mainstream media move. Pick some individual phrase of Donald Trump, focus on literally that word without actually interrogating the substance of what's at issue. The word was chosen for a reason. we are in the middle of a cultural war in this country. The well, you know what? It, it, it's reason. actually describing a series of behaviors. You have Antifa and other related groups that have been burning down cities for the last three years in this country. Would you describe them as vermin? violating the rule of law. We have an invasion on our southern border. We have millions of people crossing our southern border. Let's talk about the substance okay. of why we have to recognize would, that we're not in ordinary you, times. Would you so use that language The vocabulary language of the vermin or not is not what's important. Well, I haven't used that language. So, so you can look you? at my, my track record on the campaign trail. I talk about the issues. We all talk about them differently. But what I'm not going to do is play some game of focusing on some word that somebody else said without ignoring entirely the substance of what we're actually talking about. This is a very primitive formula, but he keeps using it. He keeps using it with mainstream media. Let me just dance around the issue. Oh, and breaking news, Antifa issuing a cease and desist. Keep our group name out of your mouth, perhaps. I don't know. But it was the question ever answered. Not so sure about that. How about Van Jones? Alarmed by the rhetoric used in the GOP debate. This is how Ramaswamy responded at Turning Point USA, that event. And then you get the mainstream media. You got this character Van Jones on CNN afterwards saying, this is the rise of an American demagogue who's going to live 50 years longer than Trump. This is dangerous. I am shaking. That's what he says. <laughs> just shut the f*** up. <laughs> At a certain point, just shut the f*** up. Van Jones at CNN. You know, Senator, um, this is another one that you're needed to unpack here because he's annoying. He is uh, young, 
with that, you know, perfect white smile and just so nasty mouth and all the confidence in the world as if he's wearing, you know, six inch platform shoes. Okay. Got all the confidence in the world, but he's annoying. I, though, tend to focus on those around him, those supporting him, those tolerating him, those playing to him. Maybe that's wrong because maybe Van's right, Senator. You tell me that this is representative of a real, real threat here that might not win the nomination, but stay on the national stage. And for those of us who wish to dismiss and ignore, well, we did that before, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And look what it got us in 2016. No, Van Jones is absolutely right. Ramashami will be around, you know, God willing uh, for a very long time. You know, I think it was Dr. Maya Angelou who said if somebody shows you who they are, believe them. He may be younger than Steve King, younger than Donald Trump, younger than some of these other extremists in the GOP, but he is very much the personification of a spirit. That does not, that is not inclusive at all of people of other ethnicities and other races. Mm -hmm. He, you know, the fact that he thinks what Steve King said was okay, the whole white supremacy. I mean, he is Donald J. Trump in some ways reincarnate, just a Mm -hmm. younger version of him. And the fact that he had the gall to call Van Jones a character and tell him to shut the F up. I mean, Don Lemon got fired for less. Thank you. You know, how dare he tell Van Jones to shut the F up? How dare he? Who does he think he is? But again, he comes from, he's cut from a cloth that does not believe that people should have agency, especially black people. He uses the black condition as examples of, you know, he's he's against the diversity and inclusion and equity and says things like we shouldn't replace uh, one form of discrimination with another. No, righting wrongs and making crooked paths straight in this country is not replacing one with the other. It is creating an environment where this country must atone for its sins and it has not atoned for its sins. And it is people like him all over this country who have the mentality of him is one of the reasons why we can't have truth and reconciliation in this country. If anybody yeah. should shut the F up, it should be him. Yeah, I would welcome that. I would welcome that about a year ago. And thank you for mentioning Don Lemon, who dared to do some reporting to at the challenge desk. challenge him. And yes. dared to just, just point out some things to the viewership. And That's Don right. Lemon was, I guess, viewed as radicalized instead of being someone who had a command of history. That's right. History and simply ask the questions. But we want to be fair and play to a certain audience, I guess, uh, until that person's pushed out. And then I guess we'll pivot again. Now, what am I talking about? But I hear you. I'm sorry. I would like him to. Yeah. Yeah. I would like for him to have several seats. And I'd like, um, well, we'll tell you when we come right back from a break. This is indisputable. I'm Sharon Reed. And for Dr. Rashad Ritchie and Senator. Nita Turner is our special guest host today. Black child, a little girl kicked off the team over what? She couldn't get the moves right? Oh No, here we go again. It's about the hair. We're still doing that, okay? 2023 is almost over and we're still doing this. In Anne Arundel County, Maryland, black mother exposing a Maryland cheer coach for discriminating against her daughter. All-star cheerleader, seven-year-old Ryan Brunson, who the mom says was booted from not only her competition, but her team following a conflict over her hair. Brunson was doing it for the past three years, was a member of the Maryland Twisters. Now, when you look, is she not the epitome of a cheerleader? I can see her spirit right there. It's just screaming through. In a lengthy X thread, Soraya Woolridge shared an upsetting encounter she had, Ryan had with the Maryland Twisters cheerleading squad. In a series of screenshots, she shared the email she received outlining the competition uniform. The girls were given two options for hair, a high ponytail with curls or natural curls, and a half up, half down ponytail also with curls. This is from The Root. 
Woolridge shared the reference pictures featuring natural black curly hair. And on the other side, images of what Ryan's hair looked like on competition day. Hmm. Woolridge decided to opt for the half up half down hairstyle for her daughter, a style she's done before in past year seasons, and Ryan appeared to meet the criteria. However, Rulridge wrote that the coach, who she identified as Shelly Ringgold, approached her the morning of the competition saying her daughter's hair was out of order. Ringgold allegedly told her Ryan's hair was considerably longer than the style in the reference photos, and allegedly grabbed the child's hair to try to pull it into a ponytail. Uh, this is just, just amazing. What a shock. Woolridge said she believed the issue wasn't really her daughter's hair, but the fact she was a black girl. Confidence Ryan walked out the door with could have been completely broken. I don't spend all this money to send my child to an organization that allows anyone, let alone coaches, to treat them any differently or make them feel inferior. Woolridge wrote in a complaint to the cheer company. As Newsweek reports, another email posted by Woolridge showed Tara Rawl, president of the Maryland Twisters team, telling her that while her daughter was beautiful, has rather beautiful hair, she currently has more hair than what the photos show, adding Ryan needs to have her hair in a high pony for the next event. I don't need you to tell me my daughter's hair is beautiful. I don't need you to define what's beautiful. Whose hair is beautiful and whose hair is not beautiful? Miss, Madam, cheer leading coach, head, administrator. We don't need you to do that. Woolridge was not pleased with the response. She feels this was an act of discrimination given her daughter's hair, its shoulder length, and its natural curly state because her hair is thicker than the other girl's hair. You're going to tell her that she can't wear her hair like that? Yeah. I'm now having to explain to her that in life, you're going to be discriminated against based on so many different factors. Now it's something that you can't control. DC News Now with that statement. Forward shared another post on X, which featured an email from the team's president saying it's best for both parties that you no longer continue at the Maryland Twisters program, Newsweek. Yeah, because that solves it, doesn't it? That solves it right there. In a statement to Newsweek, a spokesman For the Maryland Twister said disputed claims that the child was removed from the team over her hair, saying it's never a good day when a child is impacted by parents' actions. And for that, we apologize to the athlete. Oh my goodness. In our 26 years, no athlete has ever been removed for their appearance. However, we have made the hard decision to remove families from our program for other reasons. This could include poor parent behavior, violations of our code of conduct, and more. Seven-year-old says she was sad when she realized she could no longer be part of the team. In my mind, it was like, why would they kick me off the team? Because I didn't do anything, she said. When Woolridge posted the incident on social media, it went viral. Woolridge said she received many messages from other African-American mothers and cheerleaders who have dealt with similar situations in the cheer world. She's dedicated so much time, so much energy to the sport and for someone to make her feel so easily disposable, it really upset me. DC News Now. Warwick says she hopes the incident will allow all teams to reconsider how they handle situations like this. I think that the cheerleader organization should look as it as a whole about how they're making children feel about their hair, their makeup, their weight, everything like appearance wise. These kids just want to cheer, she said. Now this lit, lit me on fire, Senator. And did you hear what they tried to do? Yes. Oh, now this is an out of control black woman who who was so out of control and ignorant. She jeopardized her. We would have loved to keep her, but the mother was just so out of control. I've seen out of control parents. I didn't read any of that here. And I didn't hear him point to any specific behavior because she stood up for her daughter who has thick, beautiful, luxury. That's what a crown is, folks. That's what a crown is, okay? And she wanted to keep it in her natural state. How dare you? How dare you? Okay, I have a child. We get these restrictions. Everyone must wear their hair pulled back. Everyone must, right there, you're wrong. You're wrong. And you're ignorant of an entire culture, of an entire race history, all of it. 
It really makes me disgusted. We have the Crown Act, Senator, but I'm of the mind that you can't legislate everything because people are going to figure out how to dance and bob and weave around it. And our kids are going to get that early lesson that you're not as good, you're not as beautiful, you don't belong. And all mothers who look like me, all mothers who don't, have a right to stand up for their children. Amen, amen to that, Sharon. I know we're pressed for time. This story really broke my heart. Uh, kudos to that mother for standing up. Um, the way that this uh, company tried to categorize the mother standing up for her child to try to deflect from their bigotry and their anti-black racism. America, wrap your mind around this. And I need the TYT viewers to be first to wrap their minds around this. Imagine being born into this world and told everything about you is wrong. The way that God, your hair comes naturally out of your damn head is wrong. Your nose, wrong. Your hips, wrong. Your lips, wrong. Your butt, wrong. But let me go and back that thing up. Because now that that about us is being uh, appropriated. Yeah. So Sharon, I'm yeah. going to put that in parking lot. We're going to come back to that appropriation another day. Yeah. But this is a damn shame what mm -hmm. this company did to this baby, this seven-year-old baby. Everybody's hair don't slick back. Now, you got some black people's hair does slick back. A lot of black people's hair does not slick back if they want to keep it in the natural state. It is that curly. Part. It is beautiful. However, we want to damn wear it. You know, it reminded me of when they would tell people who wear locks, well, as long as they're clean and neat. Yeah. What the heck? Because the assumption is if you have locks, they're not clean and neat. When I taught my black history class, I would tell my students, good hair is the hair you take care of. That's right. It's not hair that's more Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. You know, and black people come all because we are the original. Why don't y'all go on and look up mitochondrial Eve? Okay, all life started on the continent of Africa. Donald J. Trump, I'm, I weaved him back in here on this. He need to go and take, he need to take one of my classes. But mitochondrial DNA comes from the mitochondrial E. So all life started. Mm -hmm. And people started to migrate out and evolution and all that. Y'all understand this? But her natural hair is beautiful. However black women want to wear their hair is beautiful. How dare they? And they did this to a seven-year-old baby and then basically told your mother, your money ain't no good here. Yeah. Because you are disposable. <laughs> and the divide. hell with it. And I mean, Sharon, imagine that though. Mm -hmm. Imagine the psychology of constantly always thinking we got to relax here. Now it's turning out that we know that relaxers cause cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one thing if black women like choose to wear their hair that mm -hmm. way. I ain't got no problem mm -hmm. with it. But what the bottom line choice. is that we were forced yeah. to wear our hair that way mm -hmm. because we live in a world and a society that tells us the way that God made us ain't good mm -hmm. enough. But meanwhile, back in the, at the ranch, all these other folks appropriating our culture, yeah. injecting their lips and their butts and all other kinds of stuff. But I'm going to say that for another time. Absolutely. Yeah. And wearing deplorable. locks. They're wearing locks. And too. wearing locks. Right. Right, they're sitting Ooh. in the chair for hours. And yeah, we You're should right. do a special episode on hair, baby. We I'm should. happy. More and more of us, I might show up here and you're going to see that. But there's so much hair under here. It might take up the whole screen. You understand? And that may be a okay. Don't cheerlead. Don't That's cheerlead. Right. Then. You understand? Okay. But you are so right. And I, it is her crown. You cut that, you damage it, and you're damaging her. You're damaging her. I just love you, Senator. I love Tell you people more. where they can always find more of you. And don't forget to post some of these cliff notes because I know people are going to have some arguments at the table. Oh, ha, ha, no, and I'm glad that you brought up the Crown Act because, Sharon, it's a damn shame we got to have people legislate that black people can yes. wear their hair natural. Are Think you about for that. Real? Think about that. It's insane. Silly as you want to be. At Nina Turner uh, at, uh, on, on, on Twitter. I still call it Twitter at Nina Turner, Nina That's Turner, okay. Ohio on the gram. And please go visit wearesomebody.org. Wearesomebody.org, a capacity building organization for working class people, both unionized and non-unionized. Anything you're a part of, you know, I support. And don't worry about what you call it. From what I see, people are finding <laughs> you on social media. I'll take this hint, you at home. If you haven't <laughs> checked out her social media, it's worth it. She's inspiring <laughs> in many ways. Okay, Senator Nita, we love you. How we appreciate you, you. I Nita love Turner. You too, Sharon. And I can't wait till we're back together again. I'm Sharon Reed for Dr. Wait. Rashad Ritchie. Uh, thanks, Doc, for letting me sit in. I'll be back here in the chair again. Thanks so much, and have a great one.